Hey y'all, Dr. Snexer again. Today's topic as we quickly approach the end of the semester is going to be reproductive strategies. These are probably strategies that you've talked about in other courses, but we're going to go through them within the perspective of all that we've been talking about in class lately. All right, so here we go. Let's talk about some reproductive strategies. If we consider all the different ways that animals can reproduce in terms of males and females coming together, there's four basic patterns that we see. We can have monogamous mating systems that include one female with one male. We can have polygynous or polygynous, polygynous mating systems in which we have one male and many females. We can have polyandrous mating systems where we have one female and many males, or we can see promiscuity or polygonandry where we see multiple females and multiple males. So these are just sort of all the options that we have in terms of reproduction across the entire animal kingdom. And we see all of these. We see examples of all of these across all the different taxa. And that's one thing to think about too, is we can't just describe um, each taxa or each group of different types of animals and say, well, all the, you know, insects, they reproduce using this mating system or all the primates reproduce using this mating system or all the birds reproduce using this mating system. All the fish reproduce in this mating system. We don't see that. And that's something that's interesting to consider. You know, depending on the different taxa, there may be some patterns in mating systems. But generally speaking, we see examples of all of these different types of mating systems across all the different taxa of animals. The other thing I want us to think about as we're going through these is which of these do we think would be most prevalent given what we've already talked about? So thinking about our lectures over the last few weeks and thinking about sex differences in behavior that we often see similar patterns where females typically, when it comes to reproductive behavior, are investing more in their offspring and males typically when it becomes when it comes to reproductive behavior compared to females are investing considerably less in their offspring so thinking about that and thinking about that typical pattern that we see when it comes to inter and intrasexual selection which of these things do you think would be most common or would we hypothesize would be most prevalent across the animal kingdom. So think about that for a second. And I'm gonna guess that you said polygynous, right? Polygynous. If we're looking at polygyny as a mating system in the perspective that we've already been discussing about male and female differences in reproductive investment, this one sort of makes sense because we've already talked about how females are a limiting factor, right? Because they can only reproduce so many times in a breeding season or throughout their lifetime because they are investing so much in each offspring, which means they can't invest in other offspring, future offspring. So there's somewhat of a limiting factor where males in many species can really reproduce with as many females as possible, or he should want to reproduce with as many females as possible, because he's not limited. He's not limited by his gametic production, and if he's investing very little in his offspring, then he wouldn't be limited um, in terms of his general resources. So we should expect to see polygyny more often uh, throughout the animal kingdom. And in truth, we do see quite a bit of polygyny. It's not the only reproductive mating system, obviously, since we have to talk about the other ones too. But it's pretty common, um, again, across all taxa. We can think of animals across all taxa that are polygynous, and we will look at a couple different examples of them here today. So again, polygyny just means one male with two or more females. 
We'll talk about polygony in terms of some of the most common types of polygamy. So we often see polygamy associated with males defending their females. We see it in terms of a resource. We'll often see polygamy. We occasionally, occasionally find polygamy in a LEC system. Um, and then occasionally we also see scramble competition polygamy. So let's see what each of these types of polygamy are and look at some examples of each. So remember those red deer in the Isle of Rum that we talked about a few weeks ago? Well, you shouldn't be surprised that based on what we talked about with the differential reproduction of males and how the males essentially compete with each other. Remember, they go through that whole series of um, roaring or howling and then walking near each other, assessing each other, and then perhaps even physically fighting with one another in order to have access to mates. Um, that gives us an indication that there is a high level of intrasexual selection within that species. And that high level of intrasexual selection is correlated with a polygonous mating system. And what we see in these red deer of rum are basically uh, males, these males here, controlling harems, and yes, that's the term we use, harems of females, where there, there will be multiple reproductive females, females of reproductive age, perhaps some of their young are also with them, but they associate with just one male, and that male basically defends all of those females, right, against other males and against any level of predation that may occur. So we see throughout this like entire island system where we have all of these different red deer, uh, many males are, are controlling harems of females and it's only those males who are, you know, at the helm, at, at the highest level of this harem that will be able to reproduce with the females within, within his harem. And different males control different numbers of females. Um, you know, some have more, some have less. But we do see a general polygonous mating system here, as we would expect considering the high level of intrasexual selection that's really apparent within the species. So the males are, you know, reproducing with as many females as they can. We also see an extreme amount of variation in paternity. So the males, uh, some of them have a lot of offspring and some of them have very few. So a lot of variation where females are essentially reproducing at their their maximum, right, at, at the level that they are able to. So here we definitely see a polygonous mating system. We also see polygonous mating systems in sort of non-harem situations too, um, specifically when uh, we're looking at species that basically have like territoriality, that's associated with um, some sort of resource. So a great example of this are tigers. Most subspecies of tigers are pretty solitary. You might know that if you're a big cat lover. Most, most of the big cats, well, tigers specifically, but some others are also pretty solitary. So the males, for example, do not really associate with other males. Um, but he will associate with multiple females. How does that work? Well, the male has typically a pretty large territory. And here's a drawing um, that was done by um, a scientist in India who actually studies tigers. And she provided this example where we look at this large male territory. He defends this whole territory. So other males will not... Um, you know, come into this territory without having to fight with him. Within that large territory, typically there are smaller territories that are defended by females. So females do also hold their own territories 
and they don't really allow other females within them, but their territories are significantly smaller than male territories. And so you tend to see three or four female within the territory of the male. Here we have three different females. You can see there's very little overlap in their territories, um, but they are all within the larger territory of this male. And this is typically associated with um, resources in, in some way. In the tigers, if we're talking about food resources, shelter, places to hide, um, these different color patches are representing for us um, different resources. These darker green are showing like a higher resource level. And so you can see that the two females sort of on this edge don't need a lot of it because it's a very high valued resource where female three has more of a lower resource associated territory. And so her territory uh, must cover more of this lower resource, if that makes sense. Um, but specifically looking at not just tiger ecology, but considering this in terms of polygony, uh, we see right that this male with his much larger territory that he defends essentially includes the females within that territory. And so it's these females that that male is able to reproduce with. And again, we see this pattern um, for different subspecies of tigers across their entire habitat. We also occasionally see lek polygony. You've probably heard about lekking because it is such an interesting pattern when it comes to reproduction. Um, a lek is kind of, kind of like a territory, but it's not. It's not. A lek is really just a breeding ground where males position themselves and then females come to that breeding ground for access to males, but there's not another resource. So in the last example we were looking at with the tigers, the females were in those territories because they live there. Those were their, their, there were resources associated with that. And that large male defended, I shouldn't say the large male, the male defended a larger territory so the females benefited from associating with him because he helped to defend their little sectioned off territories. Um, so there were resources associated with that. With Lex, the big difference is a Lex is just a breeding area. There are no, re it's not like there's a ton of food there. And so, you know, the males defend a food patch and then the females pick males based on that food patch. That's not how a lek works. It's just um, an area. As we see here in this sort of hypothetical model, there's a, a lek area. Each of these circles is representing different males. Um, the males vary in their reproductive success, just as we expect in polygonous mating systems. Um, some males obtain a lot of the matings. We call them the alphas. And so there's usually one or two. And those two alphas will receive more than half, more than half of the reproductive opportunities. So the females will choose them for whatever reason. We still are figuring that out. We don't know. But for some reason, some males that are usually in what we call the lex center, it doesn't have to be the direct center, but it usually is. Right somewhere in the center, there are some alpha, alpha males, and they receive the majority of the reproductive effort, right, of the matings that occur. But we have these other males who are usually some distance away from that lex center. Some beta males, right, our C and D level males here, um, who surround and may may have the opportunity for some reproduction from females, but it's mostly these males that are in the center that will receive like 99%, right? The A and the B males will receive the majority of the reproductive opportunities when the females come to the lek. We, this isn't actually a very common um, type of polygamy that where it's not associated with some sort of resource or there's the males are not defending the females in some way. Um, but it's so interesting. We do talk about it quite often. There's a few different bird species that do this. Um, the prairie chickens in the United States, the 
grouse. This is a sage grouse here that are defending these leks. There's quite a few other bird species. Uh, this is our hammer-nose bat. He's pretty cool looking, huh? Uh, they also have been determined to be a lek uh, polygony species. So not all that common, but it is, for some reason, uh, a very interesting way in which the males are sort of putting themselves out there for the females, and the females come to these leks. And some females uh, gravitate towards those, you know, higher level males, and those higher level males are going to receive the majority of the reproductive success. Side note, if I ever open a bar, calling it the lek, right? Perfect name for a bar. Copyright, don't steal that. So the next type of polygony we're going to talk about is scramble competition polygony, which is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, there's usually a female who is reproductive, you know, comes into a uh, reproductive state, right? Sometimes we call that heat. We've talked about that basically when she is ready for reproduction. Um, multiple males will follow that reproductive female around and essentially vie with each other for the opportunity to mate with her. Um, and in this sense, we do have uh, a polygonous system because the males will associate with that female, but then they will go and associate with the next female that's available, right, who's in a reproductive state, and then again, and then again. So the males are not in any way um, staying with that female. That female, depending on the species, may have eggs fertilized by more than one male in a sense. Um, so it's possible that this could be bordering on promiscuity in a sense. But what we typically see, depending on the species, is that this female who's reproductively active, who's ready for reproduction, will be followed by many males. As we see here with these horseshoe crabs, um, which when I lived near New York City was one of my favorite species to go and watch on the beach. Um, because you'll often see these bigger females and then they, they'll be surrounded by these males and these males will actually like stack up on top of her in an attempt to reproduce with her, which is always fun to talk about on the beach with the kids. Uh, so if you're ever on the beach and you see a bunch of horseshoe crabs kind of hanging out like this, leave them alone. They're busy. Okay. They're busy. They're scramble, scramble competing for that opportunity to reproduce. Okay, so those are your basic types of polygony. And like I said, we see examples of all of those across all the different taxa. So it's not like we see one for mammals and one for invertebrates like the crabs and one for uh, birds, right? We see examples of all of those models of polygony across the variety of different animals. And in all cases, we see that there's variation in male reproductive success, um, but males will mate multiply, right, with different females. So one male, many females. In considering this from the female perspective, what benefits might she have from polygamy? There are some very interesting models that have been proposed, and one of them that's very important is called the polygony threshold model. And this model is, is based on the theory of optimality, which you might remember from um, introductory bio or maybe some of your other courses, where we are talking about optimization, as we talked about earlier this semester, that all animals all species are really trying to optimize um, their reproductive effort as well as other aspects of their behavioral ecology. When it comes to reproductive effort, we should expect an optimization by both males and females. And so sometimes it's actually beneficial for the female to be polygonous. You think, oh, well, wouldn't it be better if she just um, was the only female that a male mated with, right? If the male only mated with her, 
and not with any other females. Perhaps, but perhaps not. So when should the female benefit from polygyny? They should benefit when resources are more abundant and controlled by one male versus another. And so if there is an abundance of resources that one male has that the female could benefit from, she should probably choose him even if he already has other mates. So in this example, we're looking at some birds and we see that this male has an abundance of shade and food and shade is important when these birds are nesting. And we see that he already has two females on his territory. So would it be beneficial for this female to join the territory, even though there are already two other females there? Well, that depends. What are her other options? If her other option is a territory that is suboptimal, that has less shade, that is not going to provide her with the resources that she needs, even though a male is defending it, she may actually choose to be polygamous rather than monogamous. So this is a model that we consider when we are comparing polygamous mating systems with monogamous mating systems because sometimes it may be beneficial to actually be monogamous. So that brings us to our next topic, monogamy. So even though we say that based on our understanding of investment in offspring and how that's different between males and females, we do know that there are some species who are actually not polygonous, they're monogamous. And so why is that? Let's, let's take a look at monogamy. So monogamy might be one of the mating systems that you're most familiar with because humans on some level, are monogamous, or at least societally, we pretend to be. So what is monogamy? It's the mating system in which there is one male and one female, and they exclusively breed with each other during a given breeding season. So there's some variability even within monogamy. Sometimes there's you know lifetime or long-term monogamy. We think about this with um, randomly things like lobsters or eagles tend to be uh, certain species of penguins. They tend to be lifelong or long-term monogamous in their reproductive efforts. Other species tend to be more serial in their monogamy. So they're monogamous with one mate for a while, but then after a given amount of time, you know, maybe their next reproductive bout or two reproductive bouts later, they are with a different um, mate to produce. Uh, I sort of think about humans in a, in a serial monogamy way, you know, with divorce rates and, and uh, multiple, uh, you know, half siblings and, and sort of looking at it in that aspect of what monogamy really is, sort of seems to fit a bit for many different cultures um, but perhaps we should steer clear of those humans and think more about, you know, fish, because they're my favorite. So here's a great example of the convict cichlid, which is a species that experiences serial monogamy. So they're monogamous for about two months with each other. So the male, this bigger guy here, and the female uh, reproduce, and they will stay together for those, you know, eight weeks. But then during their next breeding bout, whether it's later in the same breeding season or the next year, they, you know, about 90 some percent of the time will reproduce with a new mate. Either of these options, though, really are referring to monogamy. Uh, we can also consider monogamy in terms of social versus genetic monogamy. So um, sometimes the male and female are socially monogamous in that they uh, remain together as a couple to raise the offspring. Um, I guess we wouldn't say couple, we'd say a pair. They remain together as a pair to remain, to raise the offspring, to invest in them. But this may not be genetic monogamy. 
it's possible that some offspring within their brood are actually um, genetically not theirs. And so we see this typically with males um, who are socially monogamous, but some of the offspring within their brood or their clutch um, genetically belong to another male. So let's, let's sort of explore monogamy and understand a bit more about it. Uh, like I said, there's not clear patterns across taxa. We do find monogamy in some mammals. It's actually quite rare in the, the mammal group. Only about 9 to 10% of, of mammal species are actually monogamous. Um, of course, our gibbons over here, so cute. They tend to practice monogamy and our voles. Over here, we have some species of um, prairie voles and pine voles. They are truly monogamous within their mating systems. Um, now, why is this? Why don't we see more monogamy in mammals? Well, if we think about the investment, we know that physiologically, females are investing a lot more for mammals uh, than males are. Male mammals are investing perhaps time and care, but we know that in mammals, the primary um, food source for young mammals is milk from their mothers. And so we typically see situations where females are the ones that are providing the most, they are investing the most. And in that case, we typically tend to see uh, polygamous mating systems since females really would be the, that um, limiting resource. And so we tend to actually see much more polygamy in mammals, though occasionally we do see monogamy. Monogamy tends to be much more common in birds. Uh, it's estimated that about 90% of bird species are monogamous. Both parents are contributing significantly to their offspring. Uh, most species of birds have to uh, feed their offspring quite a bit when they are first hatched and this is usually a two bird job and so we tend to see um, high levels of investment from both males and females and because those males are investing so much we don't see the level of polygony that we would see in mammals for example. So this perhaps explains some of those patterns that we see. Um, in other animals, we do occasionally see monogamy, though it is much more rare. I gave you the example of the convict cichlids who are monogamous, though uh, there are very, very few fish species that are truly monogamous. Um, it's estimated to be like less than 4% of the 27,000 fish species that exist. So we usually don't see monogamy within fishes. Um, we do see it in a few cases with invertebrates. Um, here we have the bearing beetle and they tend to be monogamous with each other both genetically and socially. Um, and here we actually have an example of a reptile. This is a sleeping lizard from Australia. I think that's correct. Um, they're one of the few reptile species that experiences or expresses monogamy. So it does occur, though it is quite rare. Um, if we had to sort of pick a model group for monogamy, it would most likely be the birds. Now, why? Why do we see so many birds and some other species uh, exhibit this monogamy where that male is going to actually spend time investing in the offspring? Well, that's sort of our first hypothesis. Our first hypothesis is that they must. They must invest within their offspring in order for their offspring to be successful. And so we call this the mate assistance hypothesis because the female, who typically is the one that invests more, starting at the gametic level, she cannot provide enough care in order to successfully rear the offspring. And so in instances where this is true, like in birds, then we expect to see monogamy. So here we have an example of a penguin and we see this, you know, penguin dad who is brooding, who is sitting on top of this egg. 
because the female after laying that egg is off getting food both for herself and for the chick that's going to hatch out of that egg. When the female returns with the food, which is hard to get for these nesting penguins because it's generally a long trip to the ocean where they can actually get the fish away from where they're breeding, um, that, that's not something she can do by herself. So she goes, she gets the fish, she comes back, he then will go while she stays with the chick and they'll take turns. It's pretty extreme in penguins, but we see this in a variety of bird species where the male and female take turns um, provisioning to the young, going to get the food and bringing it back. One parent alone usually does not do very well and the offspring suffer because of that. And so we think that monogamy is really the result of um, increasing reproductive success. As a male, you can fertilize a ton of eggs, you can reproduce with 10 or 20 females, but if those females are not able to provide care for the offspring, those offspring will not survive, and therefore, as a male, your reproductive success will actually be quite low because it's not just reproducing that leads to your increased reproductive success. It's successfully raising the offspring. And so when offspring need assistance in being raised, then we tend to see that males are investing more in parental care. And at that point, we tend to see more monogamy because the males have to assist females and it's difficult for them to assist multiple females. So I hope that makes sense. I think that's probably the answer anyone would give if, if you wanted to sort of explain why monogamy exists, even though on paper, polygamy would make more sense for males from a gametic standpoint. From an overall reproductive standpoint, we need, the females need the males, right? In order to successfully raise offspring. And so we tend to see that in birds. We see that in some mammal species where females need the assistance to raise the offspring in order for them all to be successful. Um, and even our example that we spoke of last time, remember we talked about signaphids, including these seahorses where we know the males um, have that brood pouch where the little baby seahorses um, will hatch and then be released. We think that um, being able to provide that extra level of parental care actually leads to monogamy. And so, Unlike in the pipe fishes that we talked about last time, who actually are um, quite polygamous, so they show that polygamous mating system that we just talked about, the seahorses, which is this branch, I told you you'd see these trees again. Remember that moment when I said, remember the moment? This is the moment to remember that moment. Here we have um, up on the top our branches, and I'm just going to focus on this part right here. Okay, so I'm focusing on this part right here. It's the same tree. Um, but looking at this phylogeny, we talked about how the, the pipe fishes, these guys over here, um, they have that sex role reversal um, where the fish are, um, the females are not really providing any parental care, and then the males are the ones who are going to um, you know, be choosier and make their different choices based on what the females look like. Um, we tend to find they're uh, polygamous, right? They are, they are polygamous in their mating system. Um, and some species are, are actually polyandrous. Um, so females will mate with multiple males. Even some are more bordering on uh, promiscuous, as we'll talk about in a minute. These groups over here, though, remember I said we don't actually see um, sex role reversal completely for the seahorses, the hippocampus genus. Um, seahorses tend to be much more monogamous, and I don't think you can see it here very well in my video, but you'll be able to see it on your slides. Um, this lighter branch shading um, is showing us that these are all monogamous, and they... Um, do not show those typical, or they do show the typical sex roles. They are not do, using that reverse sex role um, pattern of behavior that we talked about last time. 
And so it's interesting to think about monogamy, um, even though the males are providing a substantial amount of parental care, the females will assist within with this um, level of parental care and they tend to be monogamous with each other. It's not always just that the females need help and so the males provide extra care. Occasionally, we think that monogamy is the result of sort of an over um, expression of mate guarding. So in some species, we talked about this when we talked about um, intersexual selection and um, you know sperm competition. So with intersexual selection, we have uh, males sort of competing with each other. And occasionally this expresses itself as mate guarding, where after reproduction occurs, the males will follow the females around. So here we have examples of dung flies. You can see that they are um, copulating here. And then a male is literally, he's done copulating, he already did, but he is uh, guarding this female so that other males cannot come in and try to reproduce with her and displace his sperm or provide additional sperm that would outcompete his. And so in a sense, these dung flies are monogamous because this male is busy guarding this female and so he's not going to mate with any other female and this female is not going to be allowed to mate with any other male. Um, and so this monogamy sort of is the result of this high level of intra-sexual selection where the males will not allow other males the opportunity to reproduce. Um, so in this sense, they do express monogamy. We also see examples of female enforced monogamy. So looking at the bearing beetle, which I mentioned earlier is one invertebrate that is monogamous. They tend to be monogamous because the male and the female, um, actually they're called bearing beetles because they bury um, a dead animal, like in this case, I think this is supposed to be like a dead mouse, underground. And then they, they lay their eggs within the carcass of this dead animal, um, which then will hatch and feed on the animal. Now, occasionally the carcass that they bury will be large enough that the male would benefit from being polygamous. And he will actually send out chemical signals to try and attract other female bearing beetles to come in and lay their eggs in this carcass too. The females though would not benefit from another female coming in in this polygamous sense because that would be taking resources away from her offspring um, if there are more females. And so she will actually um, do a variety of different behavioral things where she will not allow that female to reproduce by sending out her own chemical cues um, or by um, actually physically uh, interfering with the male um, being able to reproduce with other females. And so we do see female enforced monogamy in some situations. As I said earlier, when we're considering monogamy, we also have to think about the fact that even though it may appear that two individuals are monogamous, they may only be so in a social sense. So in, like I said, about 90% of birds, we see monogamy where there's one male and one female and they are raising a clutch or a brood together. But now that we are able to genetically analyze offspring and assign paternity and maternity, it turns out that almost all birds that we think of as monogamous that socially exhibit this monogamy they actually have chicks in their nest that don't belong to them. So from a genetic standpoint, usually we see quite a few chicks, if it's a large clutch, um, a few chicks or so that do not belong to the male that is fathering them, that is providing them with these resources. Um, we call these extra pair copulations. 
and they occur in almost 90% of monogamous bird species. We actually see this in a lot of uh, non-bird species too. For example, the convict cichlids that I studied that I talked about before, um, a few researchers recently have looked at the makeup of the offspring within the brood that sort of swims around, the little babies that swim around with the parents, and anywhere from like 80 to down to about, you know, 20% of that brood will actually be from different parents, both male and female. So occasionally um, the male will even bring in offspring from other uh, mothers to be part of that brood. So even when they look socially monogamous, um, they're not always genetically monogamous, which sort of leads to more of a promiscuous or polygamous uh, mating system in a sense. So it all is, I suppose, how you define reproductive uh, mating systems. Is it genetic or is it social or is it both? Um, so monogamy is usually a little bit more complicated than we think. All right, very quickly, I just wanted to mention sort of the other types of um, mating systems that we see. Polygamy and monogamy are surely the, the most abundant, but we do occasionally see polyandry. Uh, polyandrous systems are where there is one female with many males. We talked about an example of this last time when we were talking about the fell ropes, where the females are not really providing any parental care. It's the males that are brooding, that are sitting on the nests and providing the offspring with uh, food. And in this case, we do usually see that a female will have multiple males within her territory and reproduce with each of them, where the males tend to only reproduce with one female. Uh, we say that, see the same thing in the jacana, which is another type of bird. This is probably the most studied uh, polyandrous bird system. Um, and we see a similar pattern where there's one female, who has a large territory and there'll be multiple males within the, that territory that she reproduces with. If we think about like eusocial insects that also could be considered a polyandrous mating system since there usually is one female, the queen, who mates with multiple males and, and she sort of partitions their sperm um, to fertilize different eggs. So in that sense, a lot of those mating systems are polyandrous too, though this, this system is quite rare, um, again, which sort of makes sense given that idea that reproductive behavior is rooted in anisogamy. So rooted in the idea that the females are generally investing more than males and that males, um, you know, have a greater mating opportunity despite mating variants, right? So m some males will mate more than others. Um, and so we don't typically see that in a polyandrous system. Um, so this is not very common. Polygonandry or promiscuity actually is quite common, though I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Promiscuous or promiscuity is referring to situations where there's many males and many females that are reproducing together. Um, we see this a lot in invertebrates. We see this a lot in um, any species that's essentially a broadcast spawner. So these are typically species that reproduce um, in the water, which are a lot of animal species, even though we don't think about it. Um, but they release sperm and eggs simultaneously. And then all those sperm and egg come together within the water column. Um, think about like urchins or, or corals or uh, fish, right? Some of the fish that I study are broadcast spawners. So that's, that's more of a promiscuous system where males and females are really just spawning um, at the same time. And we see that um, there isn't really, you know, a, a mate choice system happening there or any sort of parental care usually associated with it. Um, so we do see quite a few species that are promiscuous. Uh, we also see a few species that are polygonandrous, 
which is sort of like promiscuity, but there tends to be some pair bonding going on. So what I mean by that is there's like two males and two females, and they form sort of their own unit, but they reproduce multiply with each other. So a bit promiscuous, but we do actually see um, formation of pair bonds, and they, they have this unit, which will then occasionally um, also contribute to parental care. Um, we see that in the dunnock, which is the bird that's that's shown here. Um, but we see the dunnock here performing some intrasexual competition right there, uh, trying to remove any sort of previous suitor's sperm from the cloaca, the reproductive tract. So even though they are polygonandrous, they also still exhibit a lot of these sex typical um, behaviors that we see in polyandrous or monogamous species, um, or sorry, polygonous or monogamous species. Um, but we do occasionally see that the, these um, polygonandrous systems develop. So with that, I hope today you had the opportunity to think about you know, why we see polygynous, polygamous systems um, so often throughout the animal kingdom. Have you looked at some examples and understood some examples of why monogamy might um, evolve for certain species? And then, of course, we looked at those examples where there are things like polyandry or polygonandry. So rare, but do, do happen. Um, given specific, you know, reproductive um, opportunities and given the specific behavioral ecology of the species that we're interested in. All right. So um, as always, if you have any questions regarding this material, you can bring it up in class when I see you or, of course, email me at any time. Looking forward, if you have not done it yet, um, the Week 12 Knowledge Celebration um, should be done on Monday the 16th, which is just an anonymous survey. I explained this last week. Um, it's a survey, so your results are not linked to your name, but I'll get all the results collectively, like an aggregate from the whole class. And it's really just a survey that I hope you don't mind filling out as um, we look forward to the spring semester and how things will be taught in the spring semester. I'd like to get your feedback on how things went in this class. So your opinion matters. Um, and here's your chance. You can say all the awful or nice things you want about this course. Um, and if at least half of you fill that out, I am happy to give you all full credit on this final weekly knowledge celebration. Because after that, all we've got left is next week, exam three, and then the final exam during finals week. Um, mentioning exam three, I want to point out that there is no posted reading this week because I hope that you will spend this week organizing your notes and preparing for the exam. So we do not have any extra posted reading. We will just meet on Wednesday or Friday to finish up our material from this unit. And then we'll have exam three on Monday, uh, uh, Monday the 23rd. <laughs> All right. Um, like I said, as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me at any time. Best of luck. Stay safe out there. Bye.